Hello, happy Tuesday. Welcome to Candid Conversations with Sherilyn and Tammy. And we have a surprise for you. So yes, you know, we were, Tammy and I were messaging back and forth. We were getting ready to, you know, to get the graphics out. And I just wasn't feeling the topic. We were supposed to be talking about the lie of are you unworthy? And really, we've talked about that a few times. So if you haven't seen the other previous conversations, we have woven a thread of unworthiness through there. And maybe God will direct us to, to hit it head on again. But I just wasn't feeling it. And I messaged Tammy and I'm like, ah, what are you thinking? And she says, I have the perfect guest. Do we want to have a guest on and inter and talk to them about something? And I'm like, sure. Well, what do you have in mind? And who are you thinking? And she says, you know, let me introduce you to my friend. And, you know, we could talk about the lie of have you ever is God frustrated with us? Because frankly, I mean, I'm just going to admit today I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated about something that's happened to my family, some news that we just got. And I'm, I told Tammy just a few minutes ago, I'm a bit cranky. <laughs> and so we wonder, okay, well, if I'm created in the image of God, does he ever get frustrated and irritated with us? Do we ever feel like he could be disappointed? Because as a parent, I get disappointed with my kids. I get frustrated with my spouse. These are natural feelings and emotions. So it's an honest ask to say, God, do you get frustrated with me? So I am excited about this topic because I am embroiled in frustration at the moment. And so this is going to minister to me so much. So Tammy, introduce everybody to our guest. Yes. I met Melisa about, um, I think it, it's been two years already. Um, she was publishing her book at the same time that I was publishing my book. And we connected and we started to hear each other's stories and what they, we were writing about. And it was instantaneous. Oh my gosh, I have to reach out to this girl because everything she was saying was like, have you read my book? And I'm sure she probably felt the same thing because our message is so similar and yet so completely different. And you'll understand that as we go along. I know we've talked about my past and the trauma I experienced. She had an amazing father. And yet we both experienced some of the very same things. And I love her story. I love her. I know you guys are going to love her. This is Maliza Farndell, author of Hi. Untangled. And just now, um, tomorrow, she's releasing her first children's book. And so if she gets a chance, she can tell us about that. You guys are going to be so happy to get to know this amazing woman. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. It's awesome to be on the show. I love watching Tammy and Sherilyn have their candid conversations. We all need a bit of honesty in our lives and in our walk, this Christian walk and walk with God. I love it. I love the honesty and the, the openness of the topics you discuss. Thank you. Hi, Mindy. This is the first time Mindy's got to join us. She has been in major transition. It's so good to have you here with us. If you're here, make you make sure you tell us, put something in the comments. Um, if you have given StreamYard permission, then we'll know who you are. Hi, Shirley. Um, and we'll be able to communicate back with you because that's what we want. We want you guys to be a part of it too. So I was telling the girls today that I'm really going to try to calm down a little bit because I am like, I feel like a little girl in a candy store. I'm so excited about this topic. I was spending some time with the Lord about two weeks ago and he started sharing with me frustrated father. That's what I heard frustrated father. And I was like, okay. And I knew that because that had, has been what I had walked away from, you know, years ago, but he started stirring it in my heart to bring it up again and to talk about it. And so this kind of worked out so perfectly. So I was reading, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I'm going to have to do this because I, I, I was just like, it stirred me so much. I started to read um, Psalms 103, 13 and 14. And that was amazing. It says, as a father, and this is passion translation, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. And I was like really excited about that. But then all of a sudden, when I went over to the Passion Translation, I went up a few more um, verses. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I was just so excited. So it's a little long, but I'm going to read it. It says, this is starting at verse 8. Lord, you are so kind and tender hearted. 
Think about those characteristics. What does it mean to be tenderhearted? And so patient with people who fail you. Wow. Your love is like a flooding river overflowing its blanks, banks with kindness. Mm. You don't look at us only to find our faults. <laughs> Just so you can hold a grudge against us. You may discipline us for our many sins, but never as much as we really deserve. Nor do you get even with us for what we've done. Oh wow. my gosh, I have to say that again. Nor do you ever get, I lost my spot. Hold on. <laughs> um, but never as much. Okay, do you, you never get even with us for what we've done. I lived that way for a long time, expecting God's punishment. Higher than the highest heavens and how high your tender mercy extends. Greater than the grandeur of heaven above is the greatness of your loyal love, loyal, towering over all who fear you and bow down before you. Farther than from the sunrise to a sunset, that's how far you've removed our guilt from us. Mm -hmm. The same way a loving father feels toward his children, that's but a sample of your tender feeling toward us. Your beloved children who live in all of you you know all about us, inside and out. You are mindful that we are but dust. Mm. Man. That's so good. Where did that start? That was Psalm 103 verses what? Eight through uh, probably 14-ish. Okay. I am going to post that in the comments. That was so powerful. It is so good. Melise and I have a very similar kind of struggle that we both went through, I think almost around the same time, about 10 or so years ago, right, Melisa, somewhere around mm -hmm. there. We knew the word. She had a pastor, amazing father. So she knew that God was good. He was not a frustrated father. He was a good father. And yet somehow her and I both had this uh, event, two different events that made us go, oh my gosh, I really don't believe that. Like in my soul, I don't believe that. I say it, but I don't believe it. And as I would read these scriptures, because I read the word when I was in bondage. <laughs> I read the word when I was in bondage, but it didn't do what it does for me now because those things have been removed from me. And now I believe what I'm reading. He's generous. He's kind. It's, it clearly said in here that he understands we're dust. He doesn't get mad at us. He doesn't try to punish us. So I'm going to give it over to you, Melisa, and you can just give us a, a quick overview of kind of what happened to you when you kind of viewed God like that. Yeah. Well, um, you're right. I mean, I kind of got to the end of myself <laughs> to some extent because from as young as I can remember, I had this drive in me to really find God to really connect with him. And due to a traumatic event that happened to me when I was seven years old, I had this underlying um, theme of shame and guilt that kind of colored my whole world. And I just never felt like I was measuring up or that I could ever be good enough to be fully accepted and loved by the Father. I remember reading... John 3 16 that God so loved the world and I just thanked my lucky stars that I was part of the world <laughs> but <laughs> you know um it, to me it felt like it was just default I'm just included because he has to love the world right so thankfully I'm part of that um world the collective world but that individual one-to-one -one love of the father I never could connect with and um it was actually I was it's such such a struggle in my life to get free from some behavioral issues that um, I got to the point where I just said, that's it, God, I, I give up. I will always believe that God exists. I've seen too much to know that he doesn't, you know, that I could never believe that he doesn't exist. I know God exists. I believe in him. But I couldn't even say out of my mouth that God loved me because I didn't feel it was true. So 
it was interesting because <laughs> one night I was tucking my son into bed and he looked at me. He was very scared. He didn't want to sleep on his own. He said to me, um, mom, can you stay in the room with me? He was about three years old. And uh, I said, no, you've got to sleep in your own bed and I'm going to go and sleep in my bed <laughs> next to daddy. And he said to me, oh, man, I wish I had a wife. And then <laughs> I said, uh, well, you don't have to be afraid, Aiden, because, you know, God's angels are all around you. They're watching you as you sleep. And he looked at me with these big brown eyes and he said, Mom, but how do I know God's angels is in this room if I can't see them? So there I stood. I'm already kind of on the edge of my own <laughs> faith and struggling to believe things for myself. And uh, and I'm thinking of some kind of theological explanation that I can dumb down for a three-year-old. And the next minute he looks up at me and he says to me, Mom, you know what? I've got it. He said, you can also see with your heart. And I was just absolutely blown away by that wisdom because that was exactly what was wrong. You know, I wasn't really seeing with the eyes of my heart. I wasn't seeing what was happening in the realm of the spirit. But a few days after that, I went to this movie. I watched the movie Tangled, the Disney movie, animated movie. And I loved what you mentioned, Tammy, in that verse when you talked about the characteristics in those first few verses. because what I saw was the tender hearted father. I saw the heart of the father. So as I saw the king in that movie lit that lantern for his lost daughter and I saw that tear run down his cheek, something in me broke completely. That wall just came down. And I, for the very first time, experienced the love of the father. And that changed everything for me. It activated my faith. I could suddenly believe, like really believe, not just know in my head, but believe with my heart. So understanding how the Father feels about us and believing it will change your entire walk with God. It'll, cha it'll change your entire life. Yes. So that's my story. <laughs> Sherilyn, have you ever had that moment is that something that you ever struggle with because it's something that you and i've never talked about of knowing the love of the father do you ever view him kind of in that negative kind of lens yes and no i mean like melissa i had a wonderful earthly father i mean amazing like i was daddy's girl like had no daddy issues at all mm -hmm. um so i had no problem seeing god as father in a loving way but when, you know, when you're reading stuff in like eighth grade, you know, and you're reading sinners in the hands of an angry God and you're, you know, you're, you're sitting inside of church services that are all about the anger of God due to sin, then you start to begin to get in this place where you're afraid of him, where you don't see him as loving. You're always waiting for his hand of justice to kind of swing down and, you know, and knock you on your butt, but, you know, or some sort of punishment. So I didn't, I did have issues with seeing a high justice side of God with seeing a high um, uh, punishing God, seeing the God of what we're told in the old Testament was not loving, which is not how he shows at all. I love how the passion translation brings out the loving side of God from the very beginning. And so I, I, I did struggle with that just a little bit in my foundations of my faith of seeing that, you know, well, well, you, know, you got to watch out because I mean, I was, I was laughing the other day with my chiropractor and we were talking about how um, he, he was, you know, in the hospital for a reason, it doesn't matter, but um, he was, he knew there were a lot of patients he had praying for him and his doctor was like, eh, whatever. And so he backed up a couple steps and his doctor's like, well, what happened? He's like, I don't want to get singed by lightning when God strikes you. <laughs> and so that's such a common statement of thinking that God is going to strike us with lightning for saying something ridiculous, you know, or not having faith or just this non-loving side of God. So I think that still permeates culture quite a bit for people to think that God doesn't love them or that, um, you know, he's looking for a way to kind of punish us. And so there is some of that still in um you know, in the foundations of my faith that 
um, you know, I'm continually watching for and being like, I, God, I know that you love me. You, you, from the foundation of the world, the very beginning of creation, they knew the plan was for God so loved this world yeah. that Jesus was going to come and set us free. And, you know, and that was from the love of the father from the very, very beginning. And that's why we were created. He wanted a family and he wanted people who were going to choose to love him back. Um, and so I think when we can see the Bible through the lens of his love, instead of, you know, and through his tenderheartedness and see his, him as a father, that will, that will help bind up a lot of brokenness that I think we have. Absolutely. And he even knew that we were going to struggle with this. So he said, you know, and this is a passion translation. You don't look at us only to find our faults just so you can hold a grudge against us. I think if a lot of Christians would be honest, unconsciously, we sometimes feel that way that God one, I mean, this is, I even thought, you know, God's going to punish me. God enjoys testing me, you know, like a drill sergeant unconsciously. I really thought, I remember saying many times throughout my walk, the first 25 or 30 years, um, I can't take your testing anymore, God, you know? And I know, I remember back in the nineties, it was almost like a badge of honor. If God was testing you, you know, and if you were going through something, it was a badge of honor. It signified you must be more holy. That is a lie. And we are smashing that today. God does not look. What if I'm telling you guys from experience, those of you that are listening, what if instead of you constantly wondering and feeling guilty about every single thing you've done or thought or whatever, instead you literally start to think, man, he thinks about me all the time because he adores me, because he loves me, because he's fascinated with the person that he created. It changes everything. And you can literally move from that bondage, you know, and the guilt and the shame. That's all part of breaking all of the lies is seeing him for how good he really is. And I want to tell you one really quick thing, a major breakthrough in my life about even just four years ago, three, four years ago, here it had this massive, you know, encounter with God, things had really changed. And there was, there was a relationship in my life within close, <laughs> trying to be delicate, somebody that was close in my world um, that really had was continually hurting me. Um, and, you know, we tried to set up boundaries around that situation, but every single day I felt guilt that as a believer, I should be able to handle this. I should be able to do better. And I literally unconsciously beat myself up constantly about this. And I'm one day I'm in a, actually in a worship service and a concert. And I almost hear the audible voice of God say to me, Tammy, I didn't ask you to live like that. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I didn't tell you that you needed to be like that, where you, you know, felt guilt over this situation. And I didn't put those expectations on you. And it was freedom. He said, I did ask you to forgive though. And I said, okay, that's a deal. I'll forgive. That's not a problem. But I was beating myself up, expecting stuff from myself as if I were literally going out and fornicating or doing something horrible. So it can be the big sins, but it can be those little tiny foxes and things that go on in our heart that what separate us from the intimacy of the father. And God doesn't want that. He wants us to have intimacy with him. Melissa, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what, was really helpful to me when I was when I watched that movie um, was seeing the character of Gothel as that voice in my head that is driven by the enemy and having that picture of knowing that the father loves me because I am his child that voice in my head of shame and guilt and condemnation that is not from him. That's right. You know, and that's so interesting that all my life I believed that it was him who made me feel less than worthy. But actually, 
you know, John 10, 10 says that we have an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And um, I never really paid attention to that. So suddenly I had a visual of actually being stolen from that relationship with the father. Mm. It was identity theft from the very beginning. I didn't know who I was because I believed all these lies from as early as I can remember. Mm. So having kind of that image in my mind, so I know when I start to go down that thought line of I am not good enough or I'm not measuring up, even reading the word, right? We can read the Bible and feel absolutely awful about ourselves. <laughs> or we can read the Bible. I mean, I, I think of 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about love is patient, love is kind. You know, I don't I get to line three and I feel so condemned, right? <laughs> because <laughs> I, can't, I can't measure up to, to it. Um, after I had that experience, understanding who I was, that I'm created in the image of this awesome father, he is alive and living inside of me. I am love because he is love. And I am being transformed from glory to glory in him as his child. So now I read 1 Corinthians 13 and I go, God, you're awesome. And I am awesome because I am your child. And I look like you, Father. I am love too. I can now relate with love rather than feel bad because I'm not loving enough or good enough. And I think for such a long time, I looked at myself through that lens of not measuring up. Um, but understanding how the Father feels about us, it just, it just frees us to be who we are, grow, and to grow in him, just knowing that he's already pleased with you, no matter how you perform today, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, he's completely 100% fully pleased with you. That is one of the most freeing um, truths that you can ever embrace. Mm -hmm. That, that's so powerful because what you when you understand how God is towards us, then we can begin to understand the voices in our head and where they're coming from. We can then discern by knowing the truth. We can then discern who's the voice. And I love the story. And I think it's either I think it's John chapter five. It might be John chapter three, where where Jesus is talking about the sheep, and he says, you know, the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. A stranger's voice they will not follow. So when we know the voice of the Father, when we know the voice of Jesus, when we know the voice of you know the Holy Spirit, then we can then filter out the rest of it. So when Paul says, capture those thoughts. When he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it means when those thoughts come in, we can then filter them between whose voice is that? That's always the first test. Whose voice is that? Is this the voice of my, of, you know, of God, either the father, the son or the Holy spirit? Is this that voice or does it sound like condemnation or shame or guilt or does it sound like a lie of the enemy and the whole reason we're even having these conversations is to expose the liar because that's what Jesus calls him he calls him a liar and when we can know the lies then when we can compare it with the truth and it's easier to filter out these thoughts that come into our head because from the very beginning it's the the first lie the very the very beginning in the garden the serpent says to Eve did God say He's been challenging the voice of God from the very beginning. And so when we know what the Father says about us, who he says we are, then all of those voices, even if it's our own insecurities, yeah. when they start whispering inside of our head and coming up with thoughts and feelings and stuff, we can then discern rightly whether or not this is our voice of flesh, of insecurity, whether it's the voice of the liar who's coming to steal, kill, and destroy us, or whether it's the voice of our God and all the different ways, all of his different names. I love how you said his name is love. It is. So if that's who he is, then if we don't hear love, it's that's probably a key that it's not him. Yes. And that's if it's 
because he, now he does correct, he does discipline those he loves, but it never sounds like condemnation. It never sounds like guilt. And so I love that you've just kind of brought up this idea of recognizing the voice that's speaking to us and understanding when we know the truth of who he is and who he says we are, then we can really filter anything against that. That's so powerful. And I yeah. love that you said, Sherlyn, even when we do mess up and we do need discipline, he still doesn't call you cheater, liar. He doesn't call you those things because that's not who you really are. It's what you did, right? If I go out and I cheat or steal, I cheated and I stole. That's not who I am. No. So he won't address us with that condemnation. So you might be saying, if you're listening to us, yeah, but you don't understand what I did. Right. You don't understand. I had this. I did this. I did that. I don't care what it is that you've done. The truth of the matter is that's not who you are. And he is willing. We just read it. He's more than gracious, more than kind, overflowing like a river that comes up. He's more than willing to forgive you. So you do not let condemnation and the enemy keep you from running to the one that adores you and loves you and simply says, I've got forgiveness for you. And not just, and yes, but to add on to that, for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, that have Jesus as our savior, God doesn't look at us with our sin. He sees us covered in the blood of Jesus. He sees what Jesus paid for and purchased. So even if you did just do those things, you're still in Christ and, Christ, and he's seeing you as whole and as spotless, even with sin on your hands. He's seeing you as spotless. So that's when the gift of repentance, when we say, God, I screwed up. I did something I shouldn't have. And we come and we turn from it and we come back to God and we say, I messed up. Forgive me. And he's like, forgive you for what? Yep. And we don't understand that because we as a culture understand harboring things against each other. So I love that the Passion Translation says he doesn't look to hold a grudge. He's not looking for something to dangle over our head like some sort of blackmail to say, well, you know, that time, that's not him. He's like, I don't see it, Sherilyn. I don't see it, Tammy. I don't see it, Melissa. I, I see you through the eyes of the blood of Jesus and you're spotless. Yeah. And that doesn't make you want to go sin more. What does that do? No. Oh, it breaks you to the most beautiful point where you go, wow, you really do love me. Because mm -hmm. I know some people get all worried about that. Oh my gosh, you know, you're you're talking about way too much grace. People might take that. Oh, please. Real grace and real truth bring freedom. They don't give you a license to sin. It yeah. brings repentance. It's his goodness and kindness that leads us to repentance, not condemnation. No. And he even tells us that he's going to give us a chance to repent in private. But the word also says that if we don't repent, everything that will be done will be, be shouted from the rooftops. So <laughs> he's, he's still going, we're still going to have to reap what we sow. If we sow sin, we reap the consequences of sin. There's that law does not change. What does change is the fact that he doesn't see us that way. He sees us from a place of healing and wholeness and victory and everything that Jesus paid for. And he sees us as now in a right relationship with him, with the father, the way we can just completely saturate the love that he has for us. And because it's like David says, obedience is better than sacrifice. We, we get to the place where we want to please the father because of how much he loves us. Yes. When my kids know that, oh my gosh, you know, when they know how much I love them, they are more than willing to do what I ask them to do. Not because they're afraid of my stiff hand or afraid of losing their phone. I mean, there are days that that happens still, like not the stiff hand to these days, but, but you know, the, the days that they lose their phone, but they know they want to do things because I've asked because they love me and I love them. And so we're it's the same way with the father. When we know he loves us and we love him back, then, you know, then there's, you want me to say something to the clerk at the checkout line? I'll say it because I know you love her. I'll do things for him in the, the law, the, the obeying the law and, and not sinning. That stuff becomes easier as we get more sanctified, as we become more and more like Jesus. 
Um, so I love, I love this conversation. This has been so good. Melissa, did we cut you off? <laughs> no, no, it's awesome. I love it. Love it. Love listening. <laughs> I was thinking what you said was that for way too many years. I mean, I think I got born again at like 18 or nine. I think it was 19. From 19 to about 45, all I ever did was try to do things to earn his love. Yes. I tried to be a good person, do the things right, follow the rules and all that. And then when you, like you said, Sherilyn, you said it, when you know it, when you know it, all of that stuff goes out the window and you actually start to enjoy mm -hmm. him, enjoy your relationship instead of trying to earn it. And it's, it's funny. I think Melissa, you had mentioned to me too. Um, I think you, can you share what you share with me about, um, you as a you know having a good father you thought how could i you got as being frustrated but you thought it was because of what the fact that you were frustrated yeah you. yeah you know it's it's true like i i was always trying so hard to be good but not measuring up to my own high standards you know and i was beating myself up and i think i thought that my attitude towards myself was god's attitude towards me that he was hard on me because I was hard on me. And I had to learn that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't hard on me. And I, I just want to go back to what Sherilyn was saying about discernment as well, because I think something really powerful happens when we know those two things, who God says we are and who, um, well, who he is, how much he loves us and who he says we are. It's, it, it gives us authority to take uh over the enemy and over the lies so we're able to discern and there's this amazing scene in the movie where rapunzel has this revelation and she puts all the pieces of the puzzle together and she realizes who she is and it puts fire in her belly so when she walks out of that room mm. she sees gothel and she grabs her by the wrist and she says no i will not believe the lies anymore so not only give it does it give us you know, a strong sense of identity, but it gives us authority over all the power of the enemy, over the power yeah. that he has in our lives. And that's what he does. You know, the only power the enemy has is the power that we give him mm -hmm. and the access that we give him to our lives. So when you know who you are, you know how much you are loved by the creator of heaven and earth. Man, his time is up. His time mm. is that is so good. I love how what you just said there, when we, the enemy only takes the power that we give him. And then you said that um, he was capitalizing on what you thought about yourself. Yeah. When you open that door and we have thoughts in our head, I love how Bill Johnson says, I cannot afford to have thoughts in my head that God does not have about me. Ooh. Why? Because that opens the door for the enemy to hit us with it. Because then he's like, ooh, she believes that about herself. Well, I'm going to use it now. And then he comes in like the slimy snake that he is. And he then begins to tell us things that validate our false beliefs about ourselves. And then now it's our flesh or our insecurities and the enemy now teaming against what God says. That's even harder to break off when we believe the, when we believe the lie first. Right. Yeah. And, you know, oh my gosh, that is so powerful. So we're going to just quit giving the enemy any kind of room. And so let's just declare right now that we, we are who he says we are. And if you don't know who you say, if you don't know what God says you are, reach out. We are glad to help you identify who God says you are, because that is going to be the foundation. And you said, you said it so powerfully, the fire gets inside of your belly and it burns and it comes out of you and it's like it's like a who was it the prophet jeremiah that had the fire in his belly and he's just like the fire begins to come out of you and then you're like i'm not putting up with that and if i'm not putting up with it i'm not putting it up with it on you that's the whole reason we have these conversation series it's because tammy and i are done having putting up with this baloney from anybody and so we want to empower you to find that fire in your belly based on the truth and say, you know what? We are going to go after the enemy because he's done taking my territory. This is mine. And I love that. It all comes from a place of knowing who God says you are. Yeah. And I want to add too, don't just settle for just saying the word. 
okay? Stay with me for a moment. I know that makes people nervous. The word is powerful to a double-edged sword. I get it. It's the word of God. It is Jesus. Don't just settle, though, for saying it. Because I did. I settled for umpteen years just saying it. There is a point when you believe what you're saying that the power of the word becomes like, you know, this sword, you know, that is completely powerful. So I want to encourage you that if you're just at that stage where you're just saying it in sheer hope, <laughs> no, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you don't really believe it, that's okay. Get along with them and say, God, I don't know why, but I'm struggling to believe this. Can you show me why? Because that's your word. It's the truth. Why am I not believing it? Have that intimate conversation with him. Or if it's any of the other scriptures, like, God, I'm seeing you as, I think you're looking for my faults. Then go to the word, read what we just read in Psalms 103 and say, okay, now I'm really struggling with that. Show me why. There's always a why. If you are not going like you just did, woo, woo, God, I believe that. If you're not doing that about a scripture, there's a reason why. Get along with them. Say, I don't, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time. And he will show you why. It could be a memory from something that happened years ago. It could be something somebody said, something that you chose to believe. We don't have to settle to just be these religious Christians that are like, yes, Brother, I am. No, we can have it burning in our belly. Yeah. Like you said, Sherlyn, and it should be. It is time for those of us that are Christians to start really believing what we say. So I encourage you, get alone with him and tell him what you're struggling with and freedom will come. Yes, yes. Well, Melissa, I, I hate to throw this on you. So I feel free to say no. Would you please pray for those that are watching to just and impart this um, on them from what you have received from the Lord? Because that's when we not only is it just the power of the testimony, but when we impart our testimony on somebody else, it it just releases that anointing for other people to just walk in it. So would you please pray for those that are walking this out and, you know, that are in this place of really wanting to hold on to what we're talking about today, but maybe don't know how, or who just need a little bit of a boost because they're almost there. The fire's kind of started in their belly, but they haven't quite started to breathe it out. Yeah. Well, I was just looking for my Bible because I would like to declare Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. It's not close, but I know enough, I think, to just release those scriptures. And one of the things I want to release to anybody who's listening is Ephesians 1, 17, that talks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And I just release that over you, that you will really have a flood of light. Mm -hmm. Just fill your heart and your eyes so that you can see who you are, that you will see how much you are loved by the Father, that you will see the glorious inheritance that you have as a saint in light, and that you will know that you are seated in Christ in heavenly places right now, completely pleasing the Father, and you have that same spirit living in you. And I also release Ephesians 3 over you that you will experience the love of the Father in all its dimensions, the height, the depth, the width, that you will feel that explosive power of his love being rooted and grounded in, in that love so that you will be just a body filled and flooded with the love of God himself. And Ephesians 3.20 says that, God is able to do super abundantly far above all you can ever hope, dream or imagine according to that power that is alive in you or that is at work in you. And that is the love of the Father. So I release that to you and I bless you with that today. And uh, I'm excited because I know God is going to do some miraculous things in your heart and give you a revelation of how awesome he is and how awesome you are because you are loved by him. Mm, that's so beautiful. And for people who have that have never met you before, where can they find your book and how can they get in contact with you? Right. My book should be available on Amazon on the 7th of December. Um, I did a bit of a revamp on it. So it's second edition that's coming out. And I am also waiting for my website to become live on the 7th of December as well. That's at melisafandel.com. 
and I've got a Facebook page if anybody wants to look it up um, and keep up to date with what's going on with me. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And I want to pray for Shirley because, um, and Shirley, thank you so much for being so honest and real. She said, this validates what happened this morning for her. I felt so unworthy and behind in what I needed to be doing and so sure the father would give up on me. Goodness, that's exactly what the devil does. But as I readied, as I readied to, what is I, Okay, to read the word, a warm rush of absolute mm -hmm. love washed over me, and I just cried because he was pouring into me and showing me as well. Guys, we can experience his love. We don't have to take it by sheer faith. There is faith, there's seasons, there's all of that. I'm not saying there's not, but we can experience it, and that's what God did for her. And I just want to pray specifically because Shirley is in the midst of writing a book as well. Um, and so I pray for Shirley that... Um, that she'll be able to just put her ducks in the right order. Things will be really productive, clarity. Uh, she'll know what she has to focus on when she needs to focus it and that she will have peace that passes all understanding when maybe the schedule gets changed or mixed up and she can't do what she wants to do. But I declare that she will get that book out on the exact day that God has for her to be able to release that in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh my goodness. Thank you guys for being here with us today. We went a little long, but we had a wonderful guest with us. And so thank you for hanging out with us. If you were watching this on the replay, just drop replay in the comments. We want to know that you are here. Um, I think on the schedule for next week, let me just kind of peek and take a look. It's so funny because this was really just supposed to be a fun project for October. And here we are already <laughs> two months in and we're still uh, getting plenty of things to talk about. So if you have something that you would like, a lie that you would like us to expose, then let us know. But next week, we're going to be talking about the orphan spirit. And I tell you what, this one is a doozy. And I have a fun story about my dog. So don't want to miss it. Next week, 10, I'm sorry, 1230 Mountain Time. Um, join us back here at YouTube and Facebook Live on both Tammy and Sherilyn's uh, author pages. So, so glad to have you with us, Melissa. Bless you. Blessings on your book. I can't wait to get a copy of it in my hands. I love it when God speaks to us through movies. Um, he does that a lot to me too. And so I love that. I can, I can relate so much. So thank you for being here. Um, everybody have a blessed Tuesday and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.